So we, I spoke this morning on having a why and the need for a why. If you're going to do a, let's see, we aligned it with New Year's resolutions and the concept that when you have a New Year's resolution, unless you attach it with a very strong why you're doing it, there's a really good chance that three or four days or two or three weeks in, you're just not going to feel the need to continue doing it. And the perfect example is gym memberships. How many of you have a routine where you visit a gym at least on some regular occurrence? How many of you drive by a gym? <laughs> Daily. It's on my way to the donut shop. So, you drive by a gym in January, it's just like, man, this place is packed, it's hopping. The nice part is, what they entice you to do is buy an annual membership. And you buy it in January, and then they get to collect on it the rest of the year because you forget, or you look at it and go, well, I might go in March. And then in May, you know what? I might use it for basketball one evening. And then by September and December, you're looking at it going, man, I spent how much on a gym I visited seven times this year? Man, that was an expensive membership. But that's the concept. There, there wasn't a strong enough reason to motivate you when it was 4.30 on the 17th day to get up and get out of bed and go to the gym and say, you know what? It's not going to matter if I miss today. It's not going to matter if I miss the next day. And then a couple months later, oh, I haven't been there for a while. So you have to believe that change is of the utmost importance before you will be willing to follow through. You need to know that choosing vegetables over burgers and fries will keep you from having to give yourself a shot with a needle in the stomach for the rest of your life in order for you to change to eat vegetables. That is some of our reality. If you want me to eat those vegetables, you have to threaten me with a needle that I have to poke in my stomach every day. Uh, I guess those vegetables aren't that hard to struggle down, are they? But we have to have that why. So we use the illustration of Peter and after Christ died, he and seven other disciples are just gathered around their meeting. And Peter says, you know what? I'm going fishing. I got nothing else to do right now. There's nothing else driving me. There's no other why. I got to go fishing. That's what I'm familiar with. That's what the habit of life has been. I'm going fishing. They go with him. And then Christ comes up and says, hey, have you, have you caught any fish? He said, no. Put your net on the other side of the boat. He's telling guys that have been trained from their youth how to go do their job, they do it. They catch 153 great fishes. And the disciple whom Jesus loved looked at Peter and says, it's the Lord. And Peter throws a coat on, jumps in the water, and they go, and Christ looks at him and goes, hey, do you love me? And of course, Peter says, I love you. Feed my sheep. Second time. Christ asks him, do you love me? Feed my sheep. The third time, Peter's frustrated now. Lord, thou knowest all things. You know I love you. What's Christ's response? Anybody remember what Christ's response was? Feed my sheep. And he also says, follow me. Peter seemed to get a strong enough why from that point to a later point. We'll just go all the way to the end where Peter gets crucified, says, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner in which Christ was, you need to crucify me upside down. And that's how he chose to die for Christ. His why was there, so his habits followed, and he became a beacon. We call him the cornerstone of the church. How's that? On this rock, not the cornerstone, Christ is the cornerstone, but the rock. On this rock, I will build my church. I want to encourage you, we need to put some feet to your why. So you got a why. Your why is Christ is going to look at you, and he's going to look at every idle word. And he's going to say, tell me about this idle word you had here. You need to help me understand why this person that you had a conversation with, you shot the breeze with them, but you didn't tell them about Christ. Why is that? They're your neighbor. They're your family member. Why is it that you're unwilling to share me with your coworker? Well, it'll be uncomfortable for me if I share the gospel with my coworker, because then they're going to know I'm a Christian. 
I just want to tell you, ding, 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 that's a good thing. That's a winner. It'll keep you understanding that they're looking at you to see, how does this Christian act? We're going to take a couple verses and look at them. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. If you're forgetful like me, this reminder to turn your cell phone on vibrate brought to you by we'd like no notifications during the service. James chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. I'll read it for you. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. All right, we're going to pause at this verse. This is an intentional rabbit trail. So go down this intentional rabbit trail with me. Let's look at verse 20. Read James chapter 1, verse 20 with me. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. How is your wrath helping your coworkers? How is your wrath helping your kids get closer to God? How is your wrath helping your brothers and sisters in Christ get closer to God. According to James 1.20, it has no such, no such help whatsoever. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In our society, the, the struggle is we've, as a society, accepted that kindness, compassion, and humility are weak. They're character traits of the weak. If you want to be strong in this world, you tell people off, you show your anger, and you let them know what you think is right and appropriate for them. You tell them how they ought to act. And Christ is looking at us going, hey, wait a minute. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I've instructed you many times how you ought to act with each other and towards the world. That's the side note. That's the intentional rabbit trail. We'll get off that rabbit trail back into verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with me... All right, superfluity of naughtiness. Can't just pass over that. And It's the ease with which we perform naughty actions and having in your brain, if you do an action repetitively over and over and over again, there's a path that's established. If you go to the coffee pot first thing in the morning, you pour a cup of coffee, your brain doesn't even have to think about it after a while. That cup is right where it should be without you thinking about it. That pot pours it right where it should be without you having to think about it. It goes back in the holder. You didn't spill a drop. That wonderful substance gets in your mouth, allows your brain to activate with the right words and not what you wanted to say, right? Don't talk to me pre-coffee. Talk to me post-coffee. I think that's the concept most people employ. So superfluity of naughtiness would be this concept that You've allowed yourself to take this action down this naughty path so often it's natural and it's a normal path. Superfluity of naughtiness is how I would apply it for me personally. So going back, verse 21. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Here's the next part and where we're going to hang our hat tonight. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For any, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we talked about having a why this morning. Now we're going to talk about putting feet to your why. Scripture specifically references here, this is one of those things in the Christian life that you're supposed to do. We sometimes get frustrated with this concept of do's and don'ts, but I think if you're going to look at James chapter 1, you're going to find there are do's, like be a doer. That's definitely a do you're supposed to do, be a doer of the word. So any idea what the word doer means? Someone can just randomly guess at this one. I think you'll be right. 
You'd be a performer of some action, right? Or a carrier out of. That's how some of the uh, Greek lexicons actually explain it. A carrier out. So be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. So we're going to look at this. I'll point you to a couple verses and recommend a couple do's. Psalm chapter 5, verse 3. You're going to have to keep your fingers ready. Psalm chapter 5. Should we have a sword drill? No, this is the answer. Psalm 5.3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Psalm chapter 5 and verse 3. I, re I recommend um, memorizing this verse. There's a specific instruction here that David is saying, this is what I follow, and God, this is what I do. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. You're going to hear me when I get up. We're talking. And you and I, we're, I'm going to have a conversation with you. I'm going to direct my prayer to you. You know, I find if I share my frustrations with God, I don't feel the need to share them with other people. But if I don't share my frustrations with God, I feel the need to share them with other people. And this comes specifically when we're dealing with each other. We're in the church. So-and-so said something. If I direct my prayer to God, I don't feel the need to talk about them with everybody else. But if I direct my frustrations to someone else, you know what, God? Forgot about it. And then we got to apologize and make amends, all that kind of stuff. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, will look up. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. You're familiar with this. You can quote it with me. But we'll turn there anyway. That way we don't misquote it, right? <clears throat> Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Read these verses with me. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You and I are encouraged. This is praying. Ask, seek, and knock. You and I are encouraged to pray. Christ doesn't look at us and say, Ah, oh, you again? Didn't I just answer a bunch of prayer requests from you yesterday? Are you kidding me? You're such a needy person. Nag, nag, nag. Now Christ is looking at us going, Come on. You're bringing them to the right place. I'm the uh, officer in this plant that I'm the procurement officer. I'm the one that people come up to and say, hey, I have this need. And I'm the guy that gets to fill that need. I'm the guy that gets to give you the answer. I'm the guy that gets to come alongside you and say, all right, so let's either give you a little more knowledge, a couple more resources, or tell you, no, that's not a good idea for you. That's going to hurt you. Ask, seek, and knock. It's wonderful to get up in the morning and start with prayer. So a lot of what Christians struggle with is this concept. They hear a, a message, and they think, you know, that'd be a good idea. But they never figure out a practical way to take it and put it in their pocket and use it. Practical idea. Choose a time of the day that will allow you to bring all of your cares and put them before God. Set a reminder that that is what you will do during that time that you don't cancel. You don't cancel this reminder until it's a habit. What you and I are trying to do is have such good habits in our life that even when we're having a rough day, our habits bring us back in alignment. That's what we're trying to do as a Christian is get so many good habits that we have planted throughout our life that we get to this time of day, we are completely out of whack, and that habit comes in and says, hey, it's time to walk with God. Let's go. And your brain is on such a normal path at this time of day that you're able to reset and go, all right, God, you can get control back. I've been driving, and I've been driving crazy, driving me crazy. Let's get you back in control of this thing. Maybe on your way to work or 
once you have awakened and before your kids have, you have a place where you start the day in prayer. Might need to be after your first successful cup of coffee. I'm just throwing that out there for you. So number two, do number two. Psalm 119. Told you, keep your fingers ready. Psalm 119. It's right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 119, we're going to read verses 15 and 16. I say we because you'll read them with me. You might have memorized these too. I hope you do. Psalm 119, verses 15 and 16. Read them with me. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Do you want direct instruction that you should be memorizing the word of God? Here you go. Psalm 119, 16. If you're not going to forget thy word, what's the first thing you have to have done? You have to have known it in the first place, right? Unless there is a daily influx of Bible into your life, you're not going to know it. So forgetting it's not going to be a problem. You never knew it to begin with. But if you want to remember, I will not forget thy word. I'll delight myself in thy statutes. You've got to have that time where you add Scripture into your life. Could be through a Bible app you listen to. Could be through, I don't know if you know, we have a radio station in the area that we follow that's King James and reads a lot of Scripture throughout the day. 90.5 has many times throughout the day, it just reads a Scripture, and it takes three or four chapters. And the, I think it's Alexander Scorby just takes his time and talks to you reading through Scripture with you. You can just turn it on and listen to it, and you didn't have to go through your phone to get it. We have this thing called a radio. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You can turn the dial, and you get a different station. I'm teasing. So, but this one sometimes is a little complicated, right? Where in the day can I put Bible reading and make sure it happens? A couple practical ideas you can put in your pocket, take with you, and practice. This could easily be your first opportunity for a break at work. Right? You stop at work. Everyone has a Bible on their phone now. And if you don't, you could. You could take a break and just take a passage of Scripture and read through it. Take something. My recommendation is always try to get something out of it and not just accomplish a certain amount of reading. You do want to read through the Bible in here. It's a great thing. Read three or four chapters. But at the end of it, you want to have gotten something out of it and not just, I checked off my to-do list today. Another one, another practical way you could do this. Since some of you are stay-at-home moms and you have your kids on a schedule at home, when their first quiet time is, your scripture could also be your quiet, quiet time at that time. A good concept to always engage is to have a concept, principle, promise, or passage on which you decide to focus, understand, and rehearse that day. You got something out of scripture that you are going to meditate that's what we're trying to get in the habit of. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And if you want to know what offends God, you've got to read his book. You've got to put his book into your heart so that you can keep his precepts. You can meditate on his law. Do number three, Romans chapter 13. We're going to spend a lot of time in Romans. If you ever want to get convicted, you just randomly find a time, hey, I haven't been convicted in a while, and I need to be convicted. Romans is a good book to do that. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read the last verse. We'll talk. I'll talk. You might talk. And then we'll go through uh, the rest of the, the passage. Romans 13, 14. How about you read it with me? Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You want a truth that kind of knocks out the rest of our American Christianity? Is this, this truth. Don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Provision. You ask me, what is this word provision? I'll answer. Thank you for asking. It's a forethought, a foresight or planning ahead. If you don't want to make provision or plan ahead so you fulfill the lust of the flesh, what's the first part of the verse say? 
but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you got Jesus walking around all day with you, you do have the Holy Spirit, by the way. But if you understand you have Jesus walking around all day with you, you're not going to say, hey, I need to set aside time so I can go think about what evil I want to do to that individual. It's just not going to fit. They won't mesh, mesh together. If you want to look at it and go, I don't, want make, I don't want to make provision for the flesh, you won't leave yourself a couple extra minutes to stop by that store that you go buy that habit that you shouldn't have. And you go purchase that stuff you shouldn't have in your life. I'm not thinking of something, but if something's being thought of in your mind, you might want to work on that one. All right, so Romans 13. We're going to look in verse 13 before we go through the rest of the chapter, though. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. You know, we struggle with this as humans, this concept of strife and envying. It's very easy to see, well, that person got this house, and to look at it and go, man, I wish I had that. Or they got this car, this, well, we'll be specific. They got this truck, right? No amens? Okay, sorry. Stepping on toes there. But we want to look at certain sins and kind of say, you know what? It's not quite as bad as that one. It's not quite as bad as killing somebody, right? I just envied the truck. It was truck envy. That's all it was. And Christ looks at us, and I put it on the same level as drunkenness, rioting, chambering, wantonness, strife. If you allow strife in your life, that's just as bad as the rest of them. There's not a sin that God has said, this is okay for you to allow to be in your life and to exist in your heart and in your mind, but this one's not. God hasn't separated that. You and I excuse our sin. That's called iniquity. When we give ourselves permission internally to sin, we allow that iniquity to win. And Christ looks at us and says, I didn't give any permission or any levels of sin here. I mean, the worst thing you ever want to do is blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I mean, if there's one thing your kids get in this life, don't do that. The rest of them, they're all bad. Like, not on a level of bad, they're just bad's over here, good's over here. Don't do bad, do good. And if you're giving yourself permission for any one of these things over here, strife, envying, any of that, disobedience to parents is over there, if you're giving yourself permission for that, that's the bad side. And that's something inside your heart you got to work on. If you want to be a doer of the word, be blessed in your deed, you can't allow that in your life. That's Romans chapter 13, verse 13. That was, i sorry, that was an unintentional rabbit trail. We're going to look at the chapter 13. I'm going to read it for you. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself." Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 
So we hear and think that Christianity shouldn't be the practical application you could put in your pocket, use it like a Swiss Army knife or something like that, keys. There are some don'ts we should definitely follow. Don't make room for sin. Don't give yourself a pass for that pet sin. The pride you've given a room in your house, and then they've put their stuff throughout the rest of it, the lack of forgiveness you're holding over that person's head, don't allow it to continue. Don't look at each other and go, this is how I'm going to treat you, and then expect God to step in and go, yeah, answer my prayer, God. I mean, it's when his disciples look at him and say, Christ, teach me how to pray. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive men their debts as you're forgiven. The instruction tonight, make provision to not do it. Tell someone you're struggling with it and ask them to help you keep a watch or guard against it. You know, like keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You and I struggle with different things. You struggle with something over here, I struggle with something over here. If you and I want to beat the struggle, we're going to have to be honest with it that it is a struggle. And that weight that does so easily beset us. You want to get past that weight, that thing that distracts, that pulls you out of doing what you should be doing, when you should be doing it? A lot of times you're going to have to have help from the outside. You know, if you and I look at a sin and go, hey, I'm struggling with this, you're going to ask me, how, how are you doing with that? Now, we're not going to make it a thing we announce up front and say, hey, this is my sin. This is my struggle. But if we're brothers in Christ, me coming to you saying, help me with this thing I'm trying to beat, I'm going to say, let me try to help you with this thing you're trying to beat. And we're going to pray together. We're going to walk together. We're going to have a conversation. How are you doing today? How's that struggle? Are you struggling? Do we need to have another conversation? Do we need to have a conversation in every morning and say, hey, we need to think about this today. We need to pray about this today. I'm going to fast with you on this issue so we can work on it together. Make provision to not do it. We're going to move quickly. Isaiah chapter 45. Had a conversation this, what, this past Wednesday night. We were talking about New Year's resolutions and what we needed and thoughts. Brother Eric mentioned, hey, we ought to take Isaiah 45 and verse 11, and we ought to use it and hold God's feet to it. So we're going to look at Isaiah 45, 11. I told him I'm going to borrow it. He said he borrowed it, but I'll give him the credit. Isaiah 45 and verse 11, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. So we're going to move right into the practical application. Command God concerning his work that he give us a pastor. You and I need to get on the same page in this concept and say, God, we're asking for you to have that bishop get in place to lead us. We want your will, we want your work, and we want you to accomplish your work. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. I'm trying to move along quickly. I only have about 45 more minutes. The wife wrote the message. The woman that I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. If you're wondering, the bridegroom has been taken from us, now is the time to fast. It's one of those, if one plus two equals three, then three should be what we say it is. Acts chapter 13. I'm going to turn there just to move it along a little quickly.
my big why is I have my son in, my nur- in the nursery with my wife. That's a motivating why. Acts 13, verses 2 and 3. It, we'll read verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. I'm encouraging, trying to look at our church and go, what would bring us together? In this concept of fasting, we can't avoid it. We can't look at it and say, we're not going to use all the tools that God's given us to do his work. Fasting is one of those tools we need to practically apply. So the practical application, fast intentionally for a pastor as a body of believers for our particular instance. In general, you fast intentionally for an answer from God. That's what fasting, that's a role fasting plays. It also brings your flesh back into subjection. But in general, you're looking at fasting and saying, I want an answer from God. Okay? If you really want that answer, are you willing to fast for it? Do you really want a pastor? Then let's fast. Let's look at our schedule and say, where could I fast to show God I'm serious about it? I want you to know, God, this thing about having a pastor, I want that. I want you to be able to lead us how you've set up for us to be led. And that's to have a bishop, an overseer, a servant that feels the unction from God to point out, we need to fix this. We need to do this. We need to follow God. We need to go soul winning. We need to come together as a body of believers and get ourselves right. I want to encourage you tonight. Take some of Take all of the truth, apply apply it practically, and come out with better habits. Habits that pull you closer to God. That's the entire application. We're going to take a little time. We're going to stand. We're going to have an invitation.